life on earth. Did this all just come about by chance? Or by some mix of randomness and deterministic physical laws moving us along like clockwork? Or is there something more purposeful or special about the earth and the precious life that it holds? Big questions like these naturally come up in this investigation because of its truly profound implications. Other big questions too, like what's the meaning of life? Why are we here? And while, of course, there are no definitive answers given here, this investigation and the clear pattern it reveals does point us strongly and compellingly in a certain direction. So let's see where it seems to be pointing us. Before we begin, I ask that you approach this work with a balance of open-mindedness and skepticism. Listen, but ask questions, and don't automatically accept or reject what you're about to hear. I also ask that you be honest about what you don't know, which can be a very humbling and somewhat frightening thing. Finally, I ask that you set aside whatever you egoically identify with. All identifying labels, groups, categories, broad to specific, and for the time being, you may simply identify with beingness itself. No limitations. And in doing so, you can leave behind all of your psychological biases and baggage, which lets you be completely free to objectively seek the truth. And the objective truth at that. And this concludes our public service announcement about truth-seeking in a post-truth world. Remember, kids... The duty of truth starts with you. Hold on, I actually have a bit more to add. One of the greatest obstacles to the pursuit of truth is false confidence. It's a core societal problem. People faking confidence and people following fake confidence when the truth is we're almost always uncertain to some degree. It's a widespread sort of mental derangement driven partly by ego and partly by the fear of the unknown. We are suspended in a vast sea of unknowingness and feigned confidence is like a psychological security blanket most people don't even realize they have wrapped tightly around their minds and their worldview, and it completely hinders the pursuit of truth. This investigation is driven by uncertainty. Curious yet cautious. Open-minded yet skeptical. You'll see it's an approach that's had staggering results. While, of course, it remains uncertain how much truth exactly there is to these findings, it's undeniable that this will add tremendous clarity to our understanding of the world and especially our, humanity's, seemingly fundamental place in it. This could be a real game changer. It brings together a lot of different things in a consistent, unifying way, like science and spirituality. So stay tuned, but be advised, there's a lot to unpack here. The speed of light, a fundamental universal constant, is about 300,000 kilometers a second, or 186,000 miles per second. Here is its precise value in meters per second. At the back of my mind, I've always been vaguely impressed by how close that is to a quote-unquote nice round number. Because I think it's natural to be on the lookout for such numbers that seem to show meaning in perhaps the hand of humanity in an ocean of apparent randomness. But when we do enough measurements, all numbers are equally likely to show up, and their values depend on the units of measurement used, which can be quite arbitrary. But what if I pointed out the fact that the orbital speed of the Earth is also very close to a nice round number, 29,780 meters per second? Both this value and the speed of light are very well within 99% of being the number three followed by a string of zeros. Well, I'm still not that impressed. But what is a bit more interesting now is that these two values relate to each other in an absolute way, their ratio. So the Earth travels at almost exactly one ten thousandth of the speed of light. And that fact does not depend on units. Hmm, curious? Well, let me add something else. The average amount of time it takes for light to travel from the sun to the Earth is eight minutes and 17 seconds. That's 497 seconds, which means that the diameter of Earth's orbital disk around the Sun is very close to 1,000 light seconds. In meters, that value, two astronomical units, is again within 99% of being another quote-unquote nice round number. That is, three followed by a string of zeros. 
Now it's time to ask some questions because we're starting to see a pattern here. Were the meter and the second carefully chosen to highlight some of these specific values and relationships? What do we know about the origin of the meter and the second? The meter, not the distance, but the unit of that name, was originally set in 1791 as one ten millionth part of the Earth's meridian quadrant, which is the average distance from the equator to one of Earth's poles. Notably, that's another nice round number. But before that was settled, the original proposal for the length of the meter was the length of the second's pendulum. In other words, the length of a pendulum whose beat is exactly one second has a length of almost exactly one meter. So these two units are linked, which is important to keep in mind here. The only other variable to the pendulum formula is the acceleration of gravity, which hinges on Earth's mass. So the pendulum is a very accurate tool for measuring time and distance, even in primitive cultures. The megalithic builders, for instance, are almost certain to have used a pendulum to drive their base unit of measurement, which is found in monuments all up and down the British Isles and down into Europe. But what concerns us here is the ancient Mesopotamians, particularly the Sumerians, who, four to five thousand years ago, were known to have used the second's pendulum. That's right, the origin of the second and the meter go at least as far back as the earliest known civilization. The Sumerians had a base unit of length equal to almost exactly half a meter, and from this base unit, called the kus or kush, or the barley cubit in modern terms, they derived half and double units. We actually have physical evidence of this. Stone carvings of their half kush measuring stick were excavated from the ancient city of Lagash and were measured by a caliper to be just shy of 25 centimeters. Based on this and copious written evidence, their meter, or double kush, was, at most, only a couple millimeters shy of a modern meter. This means that their second of time was only a few milliseconds off from the modern second of time, and we know how they were able to achieve such accuracy. While observing the passage of stars or planets through a simple viewing slot that could be readily constructed with sticks and ropes, they would adjust their pendulum length such that it would be 240 times during a star or planet's passage of 1 360th degree of the night sky. 240 seconds, by the way, is the Sumerian's unit of time called gas or gash. We're about to get to a truly mind-blowing part of this investigation, but let me set the stage for that first with just a couple pieces of information. For one, the Sumerians had a base 60 or sexagesimal numeral system, although it had definite base 10 or decimal aspects. It was kind of a hybrid system. Secondly, the Sumerians' most supreme deity, An or Anu, was identified with the number 60. By the way, the other two deities at the top of the Sumerian pantheon were Ea, aka Enki, identified with the number 40, and Bel, aka Enlil, identified with the number 50. But 60 reigned supreme in Sumerian life in all ways, practical, scientific, and spiritual. With that in mind, and recalling all of those values we looked at before with the number 3 followed by a certain number of zeros, that is, the speed of light, the orbital speed of the Earth, and the orbital disk diameter of the Earth, now in Sumerian base units of essentially a half meter in length, all of these values can be multiplied by two, giving us numbers that can all be expressed as the number 60, followed by a string of zeros. And we can add a fourth value to the list, the weight of the Earth. The Sumerian unit of weight nearly equal to the kilogram was called the double manu, alternately mana or mina. Like the original basis for the kilogram, the double manu was based on one-tenth of the unit length, or about 10 centimeters, being the dimensions for a watertight container. And the weight of the water is this particular unit of weight, the double manu, or essentially the kilogram. So here's what we get when we put all of this together. Four values, all within 99% of being quote-unquote perfect Sumerian numbers in their own system of measurement. They had to know. They deified the number 60, and here are four rather important measurements. But how could they know? Again, this was four to 5,000 years ago. We didn't even begin to start accurately measuring those values for literally thousands of years. The implications here are mind-boggling, and this is just the beginning of what I've dubbed the 60 pattern. Let's consider for a moment the implications thus far. It seems that either the Sumerians, or whoever originally chose these units, 
knew these four measurements. That would suggest a prior advanced civilization, or at least someone with advanced science and technology. That's one incredibly history-altering possibility that we can't rule out. The one rather boring possibility that we likewise can't rule out is that this is all a coincidence. But that, to me, would actually be the most surprising because I find it to be the least likely explanation. The odds would be so gargantuan as to be incalculable. But even if we grant that some ancient source did have knowledge of these Earth-based values and the speed of light, could they have arbitrarily chosen different units to obtain different values? Like, for example, if they had a reverence for the number 50, could they have simply extended their base unit length by 20%? The answer is, not without throwing off something else, particularly the pendulum calculation. There is a delicate balance here that is uniquely and ideally satisfied by the meter and the second. In fact, there are lots of other interesting congruences that occur when we measure in units of meters and seconds. That leads to another question. Is space-time somehow quantized at different scales, leading to the kind of patterning we are seeing here? The meter and the second thus being some sort of universal time and space quanta? While there might be something to that, considering, for instance, that the speed of light is involved here, it doesn't really fit the fact that the pattern that emerges here is unique to Earth. I've poured over the corresponding values for the other planets in our solar system, and I find no evidence that this pattern, if we can even call it that yet, extends beyond Earth. So we're going to look to Earth to trace this pattern. If it's unique to Earth, then perhaps it has something to do with some unique characteristic of Earth. Namely, what I have in mind is that Earth hosts life. And not just any life, but human life that is capable of expression, creativity, and, to a deep and profound extent, the conscious experience of the universe itself, the very stuff from which we're made. To begin, I want to make a connection between life on Earth and something that happens on a planetary scale to kind of help zoom us in and introduce the golden ratio into this investigation, which has a crucial role to play. The Earth does a little orbital dance with Venus, our planetary neighbor, such that over the course of eight years, which is roughly equal to 13 Venus years, a beautiful five-fold pattern is created when it is traced out in certain ways. It resembles a flower or a kind of star pattern. The ratio of Earth's to Venus's years is roughly 13 to 8, which are two Fibonacci numbers that approximate the golden ratio. This helps to explain the five-fold symmetry of the Earth-Venus pattern, as the golden ratio is very much related to the number 5. This equation, precisely equal to the golden ratio, also known as the golden mean, divine proportion, or simply phi, really exemplifies the golden ratio's relationship to the number 5. The golden ratio is also strongly associated with life, and although we are going to look at this much deeper in this investigation, here are some of the more commonly cited and well-known examples. The arrangement of leaves on plants, known as phyllotaxis, stems on branches, seeds on pine cones and sunflower heads, etc. But what I'd like to look at now is going to get us right back on track with this pattern that we're following. First, I need to explain how the Fibonacci rule is related to the golden ratio. We will use the original Fibonacci series as an example, although what follows applies to any starting pair of numbers. The Fibonacci series starts with 0 and 1, and progresses by taking the sum of the previous two numbers. 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus 2 is 5, etc. Each ratio between two subsequent numbers gives an approximation of the golden ratio, and the further along you go, the more accurate that approximation is. The ratios will give high-low, high-low approximations, infinitely becoming a more and more precise expression of the golden ratio. The golden ratio is an infinite, non-repeating decimal, otherwise known as an irrational number. Let's take a look at the hidden pattern that emerges when we look at the last digit of each number of a Fibonacci series. Again, we're using the original Fibonacci series as our example, but this applies to any series of numbers following the Fibonacci rule. Mathematically, what we're doing is what's known as a modulo operation, and the number 10 is our modulus. In other words, we're looking at the remainder after dividing by 10, which is always going to be the last digit of any number. I'm laying the pattern out on a circle because it's cyclic, and for other reasons that you shall see. The cycle of infinitely repeating digits, called the Pisano period, that results from this mod 10 operation, is 60. 
So we pick up the 60 pattern again right here, and there's quite a few interesting things to consider about this pattern. For one, it's a bit mysterious because we don't yet have a mathematical formula for what the period length will be given a certain modulus. Another important point to consider is that there's a pattern within a pattern here. Every fifth number for any Fibonacci series is going to be divisible by five. So the 60 pattern is divided up into 12 equal sections as you see here. And there's something interesting that occurs with the original Fibonacci series. There are four zeros in the pattern that line up precisely with the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. Here's something else to consider, and you might have noticed this, but what does this resemble? With just a few slight transformations, you see that the pattern resembles a clock. I don't believe it's a coincidence that this similar model for how we organize time on Earth is encoded within the Fibonacci rule. This seems to suggest that our timekeeping system is non-arbitrary, and perhaps even universal. Consider it from this perspective. Since the golden ratio is unique in its ability to organize space, to pack and fill space with no gap and no overlap better than any other number, and since time and space are fundamentally two parts of the same whole, then doesn't it make sense that the golden ratio is somehow unique and ideal in its ability to organize time as well? In any regard, we have a lead. So in an attempt to track down the meaning and import of the 60 pattern, we are going to follow the golden ratio. That, my friends, leads us directly to life. One of the clearest and most obvious places that the golden ratio shows up is in the DNA molecule. Now, if anyone talks about the length and width of the DNA molecule as the only example of this, well, it would be like saying Michael Jordan is a great athlete and citing only his golfing abilities to back it up. For DNA, it's the axial view, or in other words, if you slice DNA like a pepperoni and lay it flat, the axial view has explicit golden ratio geometry, tenfold symmetry, and multiple nested golden ratio proportions. Here it is, it's all in this paper. Next, we have the red blood cell, and there are a couple of papers here that discuss its various golden ratio proportions. What this introduces to the investigation, though, is toroidal geometry. The torus is ultimately very important to unlocking the meaning behind the 60 pattern and much more. The torus often coincides with golden ratio proportions, and this helps to explain why. It's related to the KAM theorem, and I don't believe this is exhaustive in explaining the relationship. Another thing you have to understand about the golden ratio is that it shows up rather commonly in circular geometry. None of these golden ratio derivations involve fivefold geometry, and most of them involve arcs or circles. Some involve only circles, and tori have multiple circular aspects. They're sort of hyperspheres if you think about it. Let's zoom out now to the macro level of the human body, and we're gonna move logically from blood cells to the heart. The heart has a strong magnetic field, stronger than the brain or any other organ of the body. And magnetic fields are some of the best examples of naturally occurring toroidal geometry. The heart also has multiple golden ratio proportions, that is, in healthy hearts, which is kind of the thrust of this paper here. Next we have the hands, which, according to the work of Stan Tenen pictured here, have a semi-toroidal shape. It's pretty obvious once you see it. He actually had physical models of this shape crafted which would fit the hand in exactly the way pictured in the top right image there. We will be revisiting the work of Stan Tenen of the Meru Foundation later in this investigation. Of course, with five fingers or five anything, you know it's all the more likely to have something to do with phi, and in this case the hands certainly do. The ratios of the bone lengths correspond to the way our hands can so perfectly curl up into fists which is also a good example of a practical, relevant application of the previously mentioned ideal space-filling capability of the golden ratio. So that's one, two, three golden ratio and toroidal geometry pairings with the hands, the heart, and the blood cells, which really strengthens that connection. Here's a good overview of the five to five relationships of the human body. You can pause the video to read through this, and I'll also link to the website below. But what I'd like to highlight here is that the phiness or fiveness ends at the torso. So we have two distinct demarcated regions of the body. Let's look at it this way. 
the torso region, and the extremities. These regions contain some of the most countable things in the human body, or in other words, things that we have significantly more of than just two. Most notably for the torso, we have 24 ribs and 24 vertebrae. And for the extremities, we're gonna add up all of the fingers and toes. This gives us a ratio of 24 to 20. We're gonna reduce that, divide each side by four, which gives us a ratio of six to five. This is gonna be really important to our investigation. The decimal equivalent of six to five is 1.2, and the same goes for all of the ratios shown here on the left. Musically, it's a minor third in just intonation. Six to five is a super particular ratio, so it's also a part of the natural harmonic series. We're gonna spend a little time on this equation though. Really simple, pi divided by phi, or the golden ratio squared, is approximately 1.2. It's really, really close. It makes sense in a lot of different ways as well. Of course, five is related to phi. It's actually the arithmetic mean of the geometric mean of five. But what about pi in the number six? A circle is essentially two pi, which is 6.28319. So like phi and five, it seems that pi and six are also loosely related. So let's go back to our diagram of the human body and see how pi applies on a physical level and particularly to the torso region. It has to do with sound. Sound travels spherically. And most sound can be modeled by a sine function and or broken down into component sine waves. The bottom line, sound is essentially related to pi. So with regard to the torso region, we have the heartbeat physically making sound. S1 and S2 have measurable frequencies, which can, interestingly enough, beat at a six to five ratio. The voice is entirely contained in this region. The powerhouse of the voice is the diaphragm. The lungs are like its fuel tanks. And of course, the vocal cords are what actually vibrate and are located in the neck. By the way, the spine's shape is also wavy, similar to a sine wave. Finally, your breath is constantly producing sound in the form of white noise. It's fascinating to consider how these fundamental constants relate so strongly with each other and the human body. The human body exemplifies this pattern, by the way. Most other animal species do not have 12 ribs on each side, including chimps and gorillas who both have 13. The one exception I've found is the orangutan, but they don't have such a prolific number of golden ratio and near golden ratio proportions as the human body, nor such distinctive explicit toroidal geometry as humans do. So we started out following the golden ratio because of its hidden 60 pattern, which led us to DNA, red blood cells, toroidal geometry, pi, and ultimately pointed us right at the human body. That association only gets stronger from here on out. Next, we are gonna relate the number 60 directly to the human body and the fundamental proportions we have uncovered. The math in this section is fairly simple and easy to follow. We're gonna start out by doing a prime factorization of the number 60. Prime factorization is when we break down a number into products of its prime number factors. So for example, we can start by breaking up 60 into the product of its factors six and 10, following which we can further break down into products of the prime numbers two, three, and five. Prime numbers are numbers that are only divisible by one and themselves. It's typical to combine two of the same prime number into a single term with an exponent, but for our purposes, we're gonna express it like this, and you'll see why in a moment. For the human body, let's factor 24 for the number of ribs or vertebrae, and 20 for the number of fingers and toes. Recall that 24 and 20 have the same 1.2 or six to five ratio that we uncovered in the previous section. So here's how it all breaks down. As you can see, we have the same pattern of core building blocks. The human body is essentially related to the number 60. By the way, you might think it's fairly common for numbers to have the three prime factors two, three, and five. I did, and I was very surprised to learn that from one to 100, there are a total of only three numbers, three numbers that have these three and only these three prime factors. Those numbers are 30, 60, and 90. Between one and a thousand, there are only 17 such numbers. 
So this is a rare quality, which really supports the notion that what we're seeing here is not a coincidence. And I say that too in light of the evidence we've already seen and what we're going to see. Altogether, it seems almost certain that the 60 pattern is essentially about humanity, and definitely not just at a physical level. But let's continue with the math in this section to really start to cement this connection to humanity. So now we're going to be applying the principle of octave identity, and to help explain what that means, I'm going to highlight a few important points from this passage. In music, which in a very real but limited sense is an applied form of mathematics and geometry, an octave is an interval between two notes that has a frequency ratio of 2 to some power to 1. Two notes having this relationship share the same note name and thus basic musical identity. An octave functions as a matrix for all smaller intervals, and the basic character of all larger intervals is usually understood after octave reduction. And jumping to the bottom here, in a broader sense, two-ness can be thought of as a means of copying or replicating that offers little novelty other than a potential variation of degree or scale. Expanding or reducing two-ness has a limited effect on a number's core essence. So what we're going to do here now is simply multiply down all of the factors for each side. Of course we have 60 on the left, and 24 by 20 on the right gives us 480. Those two numbers share an octave relationship. 60 times 2 cubed, or 60 times 8 in other words, equals 480. There's an inherent likeness or identity between these numbers that music, which again is applied mathematics and geometry, really helps to illustrate. As frequencies, these values are the same note. Another way of demonstrating the same concept is by applying the principle of octave reduction. We simply remove the factors of two, which results in this. This is the end result of the combined processes of prime factorization and octave reduction. The basic numerical essences are the same, threeness and fiveness. It's a perfect match when we apply both processes. But I want to get back to our familiar six to five relationship. So we're going to do a slight refactorization here, simply multiplying out one factor of two from each side. Before we move on, I'd like to stress that what follows is not a religious discussion. I am personally not a religious person, but from this point forward, we're going to be sprinkling in various aspects of religious and esoteric traditions that seem to shed light on what this pattern means, which we don't yet fully understand. It's a heuristic approach whereby I take such information at face value and see where it leads us, merely in an interpretive sense. Ultimately, I can say in hindsight, this approach pays off, as the meaning of the 60 pattern now seems nearly crystal clear. Reflexively, the meaning of certain aspects of these religious and spiritual traditions has now become more clear as well. It definitely seems that, at some level, awareness of the 60 pattern extended beyond the Sumerian civilization's apparent awareness and even reverence for the pattern. Along the way here, I'll continue to incorporate empirical data, scientific knowledge and theories as they become relevant. With that being said, I'd like to bring in the Tetragrammaton, which is the name of God spelled out in the Hebrew language. In the three Abrahamic religions, this is the name of God the Father, and although it's sometimes pronounced Yahweh or Jehovah, in certain branches of Judaism, it's not supposed to be pronounced at all. Hebrew is written from right to left, and the letter names of the Tetragrammaton are Yud, He, Vau, He. Now, I've always thought that this was an interesting curiosity, but ultimately a coincidence, that the letters of the Tetragrammaton can be arranged in a column like this to resemble a human figure. Now I definitely think there's a little more to it. First, understand that each Hebrew letter has a numerical correspondence, a keyword association, various cognates, specific paths on the mystical tree of life, and all of this combines to form archetypal concepts that are both deep and elaborate yet can be expressed as single contained ideas, as they are with regard to the 22 trump cards on the tarot deck. But here I'd like to especially consider the numerical correspondences of the letters of the Tetragrammaton, which are 10 for Yud, corresponding to the head, 6 for Vau, corresponding to the torso region, and 5 for He, corresponding to the arms, legs, hands, and feet. The pattern lines up perfectly. We have yet another match. 
so it seems there was ancient knowledge of this basic pattern buried in the more mystical traditions of Judaism. In a moment, we're going to take this path a bit further by considering the Hebrew letter that corresponds directly to the number 60. But first, I want to point out that with respect to the English and Hebrew languages, there are a ton of correspondences between the meanings of words and the respective sounds of the letters. For example, vowel has cognates that include words like wave, vibe, or vibration, which points us back to the associations I made earlier between the torso region, pi, and sound. So that clicks. Interestingly, he, the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, corresponds both to our fifth letter, E, and of course to the letter H. But with respect to E, E is often silent at the end of words, and the same holds true for certain words in Hebrew that end with the letter He. So we have a meaning of silence. Another appropriate cognate then for He is the word hush. So between vowel and He, there's a duality, sound and silence. Another duality between vowel and he is that vowel is more closely associated with masculinity, while he is more closely associated with femininity. That brings us to the letter Samic, whose elaborate meaning can be somewhat summarized by the idea of a marriage of opposites. It's also associated with the idea of alchemical transformation. Samic has a value of 60 in the Hebrew language which suggests that this could be the key to understanding the entire meaning of the 60 pattern, and in that respect, it does not disappoint. As implied by the idea of a marriage of opposites, there's a dual aspect to this letter. This creates a lot of confusion because people often only associate one meaning or keyword to each letter, and Samic requires two. That is, if we're going to use the most commonly cited keyword associations, which are ring and prop. Ring is indicative of the shape of the letter, and it also suggests the idea of marriage. Prop is often likened to a tent pole or a stake, but a better metaphor is the arrow, a shaft that points in a certain direction. But combining both of these rather contradictory ideas is the metaphor used by Stan Tannen, who I introduced earlier. From the S, M, and K sounds of Samic, he draws a correlation to the English word smoke, and comes up with the phrase smoke ring. And what shape is a smoke ring? It's a torus. The idea of the prop or arrow is thus the central shaft of the torus, with the arrow pointing in the direction of flow. Another toroidal association to the letter Samic has to do with the sign of Sagittarius, the archer, and the mystical metaphor of the arrow piercing the rainbow. Complete rainbows are actually full circles, and they have seven colors, which is similar to the Taurus in that it too is circular and uniquely relates to seven colors by virtue of the seven color theorem in topology. So to understand Samic and its association to the number 60, we have to understand the Taurus. And one of the most prominent aspects of the Taurus is how it relates to reproduction. Nature provides abundant examples of this, especially with regard to the reproductive parts of plants. Seed-bearing fruit is frequently toroidal in shape. Apples are a wonderful example, but so are watermelon, pumpkins, peaches, oranges, and the list goes on. Flowers, too, exhibit toroidal geometry. In fact, the part of the plant connecting the stem to the flower, often called the receptacle, is also known as the torus. The overall shape from stem to flower can be likened to the negative interior part of a torus, as seen here. And of all the creatures on Earth, humans exhibit some of the most explicit toroidal geometry. And I choose that word carefully because I'm talking about certain features of the human body that most would agree are some of the most sexually attractive. So if we stopped here, one might be tempted to conclude that Samic, and perhaps the entire 60 pattern, is pointing at reproduction, which some would argue is the purpose of life. There are those who literally say, in a very Darwinian sense, that we are here to reproduce. Most of us, however, believe that there's much more to it than that myself included. Survival and reproduction are only part of life's equation, and certainly not the most important part. On the other side of that equation are love and fulfillment. Here's where we start to truly get a glimpse of what this is all about. In the tarot, the card associated with Samic is commonly referred to as temperance, a word that is synonymous with moderation and restraint. 
Temperance is obtained by mixing or counterbalancing two opposing forces like desire and reason, instinct and intellect, impulse and control. It's a uniquely human virtue, but it's also an archetypal process. A sword is tempered by fire and water, heat and cold. Musical temperament is achieved in various ways by finding a compromise between pure, simple intervals and those that are more coarse and complex. Art, which is the name for this card in another tarot system, is passion and creative impulse tempered with patience and practical application. Finally, marriage, if it is to be successful, is an almost constant exercise of temperament and in many different ways. The quintessential dualism at the heart of Samic and its related concept of temperance cannot be reduced to a single pair of opposites, but must be understood in all of its many different respects. Fire, water, male, female, intangible, tangible. And let us not forget what we already established. The dualism of pi and phi, six and five, inside, outside, sound, silence. Both in meaning and symbology, this essential dualism is captured by the Chinese concepts of yin and yang. Interestingly, the symbol itself may be modeled in 3D as a torus, and in two dimensions, it embeds multiple golden ratio proportions. In the mythos of Chinese cosmology, the yin and yang, or taiji, which can be translated as the supreme polarity, emerges from wuji, or the limitless, the state of undifferentiated, infinite potential. In Jewish mysticism, this is known as the Ein Sof Ar, the boundless light. As I have come to understand it, and as far as such things as the origin of everything can be understood, the infinite potential must necessarily and instantaneously contain non-potential or nothingness, and thus an infinitesimal point of nothingness within the boundless light or Wuji thus sets up differentiation, contrast, and boundary. This can be modeled geometrically by the point within the circle. This is the metaphorical seed within the fruit, and it sets everything in motion, sucking in, pouring out, contracting, expanding. Thus we have the first real form, the first possible form according to this theory, and that form is, of course, the torus. To help explain that a little more, I'd like to refer to Arthur M. Young, philosopher, author, and pioneering inventor in helicopter design who has written about several key features of the torus in his particular spin on process philosophy, pun intended. Here he notes that, quote, the torus is the only way you can get an identifiable something in the middle of itself. It's consubstantial with its surroundings. It's made of the same stuff as its surroundings. A tornado is a pertinent example of this. No lines, no vertices, and made out of the same stuff as its surroundings, air. It's maintained only via flow and spin. So if the torus indeed had a crucial role to play at the beginning of the universe, then perhaps that is why it shows up so frequently in relation to the beginning of so many organisms, that is, with respect to their seeds and reproductive parts as previously mentioned. In any regard, in the absence of a definitive scientific explanation for why that toroidal pattern in nature exists, we're free to speculate that it may be due to some fractal iterative process relating to the origin of the universe that we don't yet understand. Another small clue suggesting that the torus was related to the origin of the universe, or at least the ancient cultures were aware of it, has to do with what's called the triple veil of the negative. Again, this is from the Jewish mystical tradition of the Kabbalah, and I already mentioned Ein Sof Ar, the boundless light, which is the uppermost circle. Now, if we say that the smallest bottommost circle here, Ein, meaning nothing, is the infinitesimal point in the creation model I previously described, then what is the middle part? Well, by contrast, it can be seen as a ring or torus shape. But let's get to the crux of the matter, consciousness. Consciousness may have had much to do with this theoretical primordial torus at the beginning of creation, because what is consciousness? It's an awareness of being aware. It's the perception of perceiving. In other words, it's a feedback loop, which is literally what a torus is. Consciousness is also self-awareness, which can be described as the encapsulation of our essence within ourselves, but as an ephemeral idea in the mind's eye. 
This is similar to how a torus encapsulates its essence, circularity, within itself, but as an empty whole at its center. So both the torus and consciousness are self-reflective feedback loops. And what about the golden ratio? Its uniquely self-similar self-referential quality may likewise be related to consciousness, and we've seen it show up numerous times in conjunction with toroidal geometry. All that being said, we can now establish that it is conceivable that the creation of the universe was some form of a conscious experience. Wow, and whose consciousness, whose experience are we potentially talking about here? Well, you're certainly free to ascribe that to whoever God is in your belief system. But let's take a step back and consider this from another perspective. The entire shape of a tree, roots included, resembles the central part of a torus. Now let's say that this tree is an apple tree, so its fruit, containing its seed, has the same basic toroidal form. With that in mind, know that the Kabbalah has, as its basis, an elaborate symbol system known as the Tree of Life. Its 22 paths and 10 spheres, or sephirot, represent a sort of map for the descent of energy and consciousness from the original source, represented by the top sphere, to matter, represented by the bottommost sphere. Might we be the fruit of this tree, carrying the seed of this hypothetical original consciousness? Let's return to Samic and our previous discussion about its essential dualism, of which I gave a number of examples like male and female, pi and phi, desire and reason, etc. What I didn't mention, however, is the fundamental dualism we just broached here, consciousness and matter. I did that deliberately so I could more fully develop the apparently crucial relationship and relevance of consciousness to this investigation. So Samic, which was long ago equated to the number 60, seems to centrally involve the mixture, the temperament, of consciousness with matter. And not just any consciousness, but consciousness that, like a seed from a great tree, shares a genetic relationship with the originating source consciousness at the beginning of the universe. You can call that God if you want, and if so, it gives a new meaning and import to the biblical verse in Genesis that states that God created mankind in his own image. Alternately, if you don't want to invoke God, then it gives new meaning and import to the oft-quoted statement that we are the universe experiencing itself. Let me stress that I don't come upon such statements lightly. Look what brought us here. We've been following a long trail of evidence, some of it completely mind-boggling and inexplicable, and much of it highly compelling, although somewhat inconclusive. But the pattern is obvious. You and I will never unsee it, so we have to grapple with it, and we actually have tremendous leeway to do so. That is, given the compelling nature of the entire body of evidence before us, coupled with the fact that science does not have the answers we seek. For instance, why and how does the golden ratio and toroidal geometry show up at the physical macro level, especially in humans, in so many ways? One of the greatest mysteries of science is how consciousness arises. Scientists cannot explain it. And while many theorize that consciousness is a function of the brain, here the evidence seems to suggest that consciousness might be an originating function of the universe itself, similar to panpsychism. And rather than arising from within matter, it instead melds with matter by some unknown means. I want to zoom out now and take a look at all of this from a big picture perspective. The findings here seem poised to help heal the rift between science and spirituality. And in that respect, I want to compare a couple of scientific grand unified theories to a sort of spiritual grand unified theory that arises from the work of our now familiar Stan Tenen. To say this is intriguing is an understatement. In alphabetical order, the Hebrew letters are laid out here with certain keywords or phrases that not only capture the essential meanings of the letters, but work together to express an intelligible overall message, profound yet mysterious, about universal unfoldment and the meaning of life. In many ways, it corresponds to the findings of this investigation thus far, and it also points us to where this is all going. As I read it, notice how it progresses in a logical sequence. This surely can't be a coincidence. It reads, Absolute binary reciprocation distributes connection by unfurling projection that covers completely. Will, holding to the source of continuity, sustains the wellspring that inflates the great vessel to reach expression itself. 
There's an awful lot we could unpack here, but I just want to highlight a few things. For one, every Hebrew letter from which this was written is likely a shadowgram of that vorticular shape shown earlier that corresponds to the human hand and the center of a torus. It's a theory of tenons, but an absolutely compelling one because for many letters, it's just visually obvious. For some letter forms, it's far less obvious, but we can certainly allow for that given that this is a centuries-old language that has surely undergone considerable changes in its use and adaptation for writing. But consider how this plays into the whole idea of being composed of the same stuff as your surroundings. Toroidal-based letters expressing a message about toroidal-based universal unfoldment through and understood by toroidal-based conscious human beings. Talk about fractal and self-reflective. A second point is that another known cognate for Samic is given here, sustains. Note that it's the main verb of the second sentence. It's what the will does. Temperance in all of its aspects, reproduction, this sustains this whole infinite toroidal feedback loop. And finally, what is this all ultimately driving at? Expression. We'll come back to that shortly. Here's one of Stan Tennant's early conceptions that, to my knowledge, he didn't develop much further. However, the basic idea here would be echoed decades later by scientists representing two grand unified theories, as we shall see. The so-called light in the meeting tent is the juxtaposition of toroidal and tetrahedral geometries. While the corresponding document goes much deeper, the basic idea here is that these forms represent fundamental dualities of the universe. While the toroidal vortical shape represents process and mind, the tetrahedron represents structure, body, and matter. And on that point, the following two unified theories would especially agree. On the left, we have Quantum Gravity Research Institute's emergence theory, and on the right, Nassim Haramein's theory, which we might call the black hole theory. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these theories, but I encourage you to research them for yourself. They both have highly accessible video overviews of their theories for laymen, and for the more scientifically inclined, they both have a significant body of published scientific literature. So let's see how they correlate with each other and with this investigation. QGR Institute's Emergence Theory. This is really deep stuff, but well-researched. They have over 80 scientific publications, all freely available to read through links on their website. This is a developing theory. They are actively trying to make sense of all of the data that's been coming out of CERN. That's the organization with the Monumental Particle Smasher, or Large Hadron Collider, that's located in Geneva, Switzerland. For our purposes, I want to highlight the last point here which is that emergence theory hypothesizes that the golden ratio is a fundamental constant of nature. They point out many ways in which it shows up, like, for instance, in quantum mechanics with regard to Heisenberg's binary matrices, and in cosmology with regard to several calculations describing black holes. But for their theory, they believe the golden ratio may describe the relationship between the two quote-unquote bits of a sort of binary code at the Planck scale. Interestingly, the skewed sort of isosahedron pictured here which is central to their theory, has 20 tetrahedrons converging on a central point, which means that the number of edges converging there is 60, and they actually highlight that fact because 60 is thus a limit of the structure's quote-unquote coding capacity, as it were. So this is potentially directly related to the 60 pattern. Now on to Nassim Haramein's unified theory, which we might actually call the Hermine Rauscher Unified Theory, as Elizabeth Rauscher was a crucial collaborator for its first several publications. Now, this theory strikes me as being extremely compelling. I note here that a number of patents have already been derived from the theoretical foundations of the theory, so it's already bearing fruit, so to speak, which would seem to add a lot to its credibility. This is a relatively simple theory to understand on the surface. It simplifies physics to a considerable degree, and it solves the vacuum catastrophe, which is an absolutely ridiculous and embarrassing problem in cosmology. Anyway, for our purposes here, I want to highlight the fact that toroidal geometry and the spinning vortical motion thereof is proposed by this unified theory to be a core structural component of reality at the Planck scale. Now, I'd love to see scientists from both of these groups get together and, shall we say, unify their unified theories because there are significant points where they do overlap. Namely, both theories incorporate consciousness to varying degrees. 
based on the findings of this investigation, no grand unified theory seems truly complete without grappling with consciousness, as consciousness now seems of paramount importance in the universal scheme of things. So this is great to see. We're all on the same page with this crucial point. A second point of correlation, as previously mentioned, is the proposed theory for the Planck scale structure of the universe being composed of tetrahedral shaped pixels. Interestingly, and perhaps related to the overall 60 pattern, the tetrahedron is composed of four equilateral triangular faces whose angles are all 60 degrees. On the significance of that, note that in the sense that we could choose to divide the circle into any number of degrees, like say 400 degrees, 360 degrees is arbitrary. However, in the same sense, units of measurement, like the meter and the second, are also arbitrary. This doesn't mean, though, that such chosen values and measurements don't have significant, meaningful bases, and such significant bases would make them, in a second sense, non-arbitrary. So the word arbitrary can itself be used arbitrarily, and it often is. It's often used dismissively, and we have to be wary of that. 360 may actually be an ideal way of dividing the circle, as, like the number 60, it is not only a highly composite number, but a superior highly composite number. It has 24 factors, twice as many as 60, and it has the rather rare 235 prime number factorization pattern. There are other signals that seem to point to a non-arbitrary basis for 360 degrees. For instance, if we look at the ratio of the areas of the circle and inscribed equilateral triangle, we have very close to a 12 to 5 ratio. By the way, the three-dimensional formulation of this, the tetrahedron inscribed inside the sphere, is theoretically very important to planetary physics, but that's a discussion for another time. So the 12 to 5 ratio can be understood as an octave plus a minor third, our familiar 6 to 5 ratio. That same near 6 to 5 ratio can be obtained in this related geometric formulation, that of an inscribed hexagon, or six equilateral triangles, within a circle. Finally, the complementary 5-3 ratio is found in the relationship between a circle inscribed in an equilateral triangle. The numerosity of all of these ratios are directly indicative of the 235 prime building block pattern that's at the heart of numbers like 60 and 360 and is central to this investigation. Aside from all that, note here again that besides five-fold geometry, circular and equilateral triangle-based geometries are particularly prolific with regards to golden ratio derivations. You can find more of these, along with their complete proofs, in the links below. All things considered, it seems that the crux of any grand unification theory going forward is likely to include not only tetrahedral geometry, but in some way, shape, or form, the findings of the 60 pattern. Perhaps we can unite not only the quantum and cosmological realms, but science and spirituality as well. As we approach our conclusion, there's a lingering question left to answer. Why the number 60? Well, keep in mind that although the number 60 certainly does take center stage, it's not the only number or numerosity important to this investigation. 6, 5, 10, 12, 30, 1.2, all these numbers play a role. We could almost get away with calling this the 30 pattern, although not quite. 60, though, is classified as a superior highly composite number, which, besides its basic meaning that it has a very high number of factors for its size, means that it's, shall we say, a harmonious number, well-organized, balanced. Musically, the smallest octave ratio from which you can construct a just intonation scale with two identical tetrachords is 30 to 60. This scale is a mode of a very ancient scale, first defined explicitly by Ptolemy, that was used in ancient Greek and Hindu music and is still used to this day. On another musical note, pun intended, there's a special musical relationship between the three prime factors of 60, 2, 3, and 5. As ratios, those numbers define perhaps the most fundamental and arguably important harmonic relationship in music, the major chord. Empirically, it is the simplest triadic chord possible. In root position, it's the 4-5-6 chord, but its identity remains the same through its inversions. 2-3-5, 3-4-5, 
These all define the frequency ratios of a major chord. In fact, the first five overtones of the natural harmonic series together sound an open-voiced major chord. So if we take a step back here, we can come to a vital realization. The reason why we feel music so deeply may be because, like our bodies and even consciousness as we've seen, music similarly fits the 60 pattern in a very basic and fundamental way. So it makes perfect sense that we are so well and uniquely equipped for musical expression. For instance, we have dexterous hands with long fingers for playing instruments, large brains that can understand the complexities of musical theory and tuning, and we have the level of consciousness necessary for both willful creative expression and empathetic experience. For its part, music functions as a perfect medium for the entire gamut of human emotions. We might say that music is the language of consciousness, or the language of the universe itself. In any regard, music is a most potent form of expression and experience. Two concepts that really capture what this is all about. Outward projective expression and inward receptive experience. Together they form a loop of consciousness, and central to that is the return to source, represented by the creative spark or inspiration. Perhaps divine inspiration, source consciousness, if you will, or what we might conceive of as the soul, soul force behind the will to express and experience. So we began this investigation by logically following a precise, consistent pattern whose existence, by compounding probabilities, would be extremely unlikely to occur randomly. While the mechanism by which it would otherwise originate is unknown, it points us to a profound meaning with nested layers upon layers of meaning and repetition, which indicates not random noise, but a strong signal. This signal, if accurate, informs us of an originating conscious universe of which we are its sons and daughters. This is not my claim, despite any language of certainty I may have used here, but based on the totality of evidence before us, it seems a likely scenario. That is, we, humanity, are the unique and exceptional means by which the universe expresses and experiences itself, and vice versa. This is truly staggering if you take a moment to think about it. It's paradigm shifting, if we allow it. It's unifying because A, it applies to all of us, B, so many of its aspects are easily, readily verifiable, and C, it supports rather than refutes religious and spiritual beliefs while simultaneously embracing the rigors of science. Ultimately, I hope you're now as inspired and excited as I am to share this knowledge and awareness of the 60 pattern as far and as wide as possible. There are many more implications to this. This is only the beginning. And now that we're aware of this so-called 60 pattern, we can watch for it as it shows up in other areas, and I definitely believe it will. As it does, I'll continue this exploration and this dialogue. What evidence have you seen for this fundamental pattern, either in books, scientific literature, your religious tradition, or your occupation or field of study? Please share in the comments below. And please, I could really use your help to support this work, and the best way to do that is to share this information by word of mouth. Of course, links to additional information, social media pages, sources, and ways you can help contribute are in the description below. Thank you for taking this deep dive into the 60 pattern with me.